Okay. So I've got a million slides in no time. Uh, we're going to go through this uh, very, very quickly. Uh, so I'm going to provide a bit of an overview on the flood protection program for downtown Toronto. Uh, I represent Waterfront Toronto. It's an agency that's jointly uh, owned and controlled by the federal government, the province of Ontario, and the city of Toronto. And I get to operate two screens. There we go. Uh, we always have to do a land acknowledgement because we're working on lands that are covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas. Uh, so we do work with the First Nations in planning and implementing this project. Uh, the uh, Portland's flood protection and, and the broader redevelopment of the Toronto waterfront is the single largest redevelopment program underway in North America. So for decades, we've had an industrial area cut off from the city uh, by the Gardner Expressway. Uh, people weren't accessing the area, weren't taking advantage of, of the lakefront, uh, and the area just uh, remained stagnant. So uh, the goal was to rework this, and I'm going to provide some details and then get into the river. So we needed to take action to take advantage of the potential of the waterfront, and we're going to go show how this, this particular project ties into that. This uh, shows the broader area uh, that is um, monitored by and managed to some extent by Waterfront Toronto from a design standpoint. Uh, you can see it covers quite a few kilometers along the waterfront and we've worked our way really from the uh, west heading east uh, and the large area that you see on the uh, uh, right side of the map is the port lands and that's where this work is taking place. Uh, from a mandate standpoint, I'm not going to go through this given the time that we have, but Waterfront has specific mandate and deliverables uh, to get work done. And we deliver on those things piece by piece. These are some highlights. Uh, this is an overview of some of the areas um, that I'm going to touch on today, but in particular, the upper right, oops, here we are. The up, upper right uh, shows uh, what became the Pan Am Village. So there was a flood protection landform built there. Uh, to pr protect downtown Toronto and, and by comparison of the Portlands, this was a low cost initiative to get that done, uh, but that was completed some time ago to allow for the Pan Am Village to take place and be put into place. Other than that, I'm going to go through various pieces along the waterfront and what's been done to enhance and how that ties together with the flood protection project. So you can see now at the top there, um, the Pan Am Village in place, the flood protection landform for that component of work in place and some of the uh, waterfront work and boardwalks that have been put in place as well. We're also focused on the design of the buildings that are going in place, looking to put in place things such as uh, public realm, uh, retail, uh, bringing life to the areas. There's been an exponential growth in use of the waterfront, certainly uh, e uh, west of Bay Street, uh, where the enhancements have been uh, completed, and we continue our work heading uh, aggressively towards the, uh, towards the east. That's the enhanced work. I need to multitask here. So this, this uh, flood protection project is a once in a generation project by scale. It, it uh, will provide access to and remove some 800 acres of land in the downtown area out of floodplain allowing development to take place. So the land currently is sterile, limited to uh, industrial use only. And we're gonna touch on that, uh, but when we're complete, it allows for a vertical development, residential, commercial development to take place. As an example, the East Harbor project is contingent on this being done. East Harbor being a project by Cadillac Fairview involving 13 million square feet, 10 million of commercial, about 3 million of residential. And that's just one. It also houses a new GO train station and accommodates the new subway line, all contingent on this getting done. So this all ties back to flood protection. This is the catchment area, more or less, for the um, for the uh, Don River. Uh, this is a key piece I'm going to get into in a little more detail. In this map, you can see the Humber River on the left. Uh, in the 50s, there was a hurricane that parked itself over the Humber River, uh, collected water uh, over Lake Ontario with the temperatures being just right, parked itself there and wiped out roads, bridges, housing, infrastructure, uh, which triggered uh, environmental changes and legislative changes when they realized that the Don River uh, catchment area, which you can see in the center and to the, uh, to the right, was much greater than the Don, or rather than the Humber. Uh, 
So with that, these restrictions were put in place. Our task now is to remove those restrictions. This goes back quite a way. There's King Charlie. Uh, so this was back in the 90s. The idea was uh, put forward to realign the Don. What had happened was the Don River over time uh, was realigned with a hard right turn uh, just at the Lakeshore Bridge, taking that catchment area, expecting it to make a hard right turn in a storm event. Now, uh, let's frame that storm event. In a major hurricane event, uh, that results in waters, two-thirds of the volume of Niagara Falls, coming down, trying to go underneath the two uh, bay bridge. That won't happen. So with that, the water gets pushed back up, goes underneath Eastern Avenue. The rest overtops the bridge, uh, spreads across the area at 50 kilometers an hour or more, uh, one to two meters deep, taking out buildings, people, cars, everything. We have to stop that. So we got on with it. Um, I'm going to get into some of the details of the challenges that we face and how we get that done as fast as I can. Uh, so this is an overview while the excavation was underway. There's a couple of key points here. Uh, along the perimeter of this excavation, you see there's piles that have been put in place, keyed into bedrock. Again, think about the forces I've talked about. A river will naturally form uh, with water flowing to where it would like to go. So we have to create structures and bury those structures that can withstand two thirds of Niagara Falls in a major event and stay there. And we're building this on top of what was a swamp made up of layers of peat and flowing sand, non-structural, capped with excavations from the city of Toronto that then had a large oil uh, storage tanks placed on top of them with painted steel bottoms that rotted through. So you took all that oil and pressed it right into the ground. So not only do you have the stability issues, you've got the contaminated, contamination issues, so the ground is saturated with oil. Oops. There we go. So this is a map of how it was. Ashbridge's Bay was then this wetland, and by the turn of the last century, uh, those wetlands, because of sewage, uh, started to get filled up with nasty things. So it became a problem from a health standpoint. Uh, there were odor issues, there were contamination issues, there were health issues. Um, so they wanted to do something to improve all those conditions. The deci decision was made then to deal with it in a different manner, uh, but not that well thought out. So here we see what the plan was, at least in concept. You'd take the river and make a hard turn. This isn't what was ultimately built. The outflow was even worse. It only went west. Um, but uh, the filling took place, so they dredged the bottom of the harbor first, nice rounded, unstable sand, then put dock walls around it. Those dock walls have generally not been repaired in over 100 years. Uh, what holds it together really is the lake. So you've got more pressure and density from the lake pushing inward, holding the oil within the lands, less density. The problem with that, though, is as we go to build the river, we've got the lake pressure constantly coming in. So your groundwater uh, is, is going to push the bottom of the river out of place. So we had to drop these piles and, and do our best to waterproof the area to allow for the excavation to take place. And uh, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, but we have to balance this so carefully. We, we uh, dewater to the rate of two and a half million liters a day. And this has been going on for years. That water has to be cleaned. It's full of hydrocarbons and put back into the lake cleaner than, than the lake itself. So this is an ongoing effort. And we have to do that to keep the pressure down underneath the river. Then we'll pull a plug on the uh, west side of the river towards the harbor, allow the riverbed to, to fill up, uh, and then manage equalization of pressure underneath the river and above so the thing doesn't explode. And then eventually pull the plug out at the north end and let the water run. So those little bits, I can't get into too much detail, but you get the idea of what we're dealing with. Uh, this was the uh, results of the, <coughs> the uh, Humber River storm. So you can see in the background the bridges uh, in place. There was housing that was in place. Uh, this was all in floodplain. Uh, I can say that with the uh, Don River, the problems won't be solved up the river by this being done uh, because those roads, the, the gardener itself, uh, to, to some extent, but certainly uh, the, the, Don, the uh, 
sorry, roadways and the rail are built right in the floodplain. So this won't solve that problem, but it will solve everything downriver. So this is the area of flood protection. Uh, I touched on the first of being the downtown area. So that was done with a fairly small landform where the yellow is shown. Um, so that was the easier part of it. And that was a pain because the entire structure kept settling as they were building it, but that's been stabilized. Now the challenge is the remaining blue area. So you can see, I talked about Eastern Avenue to the North um, and then what happens with the river to the South. Right, there's the yellow. I'm getting ahead of myself. There. My apologies. There we go. So this is what West Don Lands kind of sort of looks like now. Uh, there's been a lot more development that's taken place in the area, uh, but you can see the landform in the foreground. It gets hidden. It looks like a park. Life is good. We, we can then occupy and build. Uh, so the concept then was to put a uh, new river mouth in and naturalize it, but we actually uh, designed this with three outlets. So first you've got the uh, Keating Channel, which is the existing opening that goes back to the original structure. The second then is this new river uh, path that you're seeing in this image. The third is going straight south from the Don River through a wetland that becomes an overflow. So we looked at you know, how rivers are formed. We hired uh, very good designers and engineers. MVVA is leading the project, uh, which is a globally recognized landscape firm uh, involved in projects worldwide. So you can look them up and they're supported by engineering teams uh, such as uh, WSP among many others. And by the way, our construction partner on this is Ellis Don and the project delivery uh, process is construction management and not P3. And we did that because um, well, we dropped uh, 2,500 boreholes and our modeling uh, was 5% accurate in terms of what we found in the ground. So uh, under a P3, it would be an endless opportunity for claims and escalation. Uh, using this structure, we sequentially tender. We know more as we go along. Uh, we are facing some tail end challenges, but limited uh, on the closeout because of course the escalation that's resulted from uh, the recent challenges with COVID and uh, a little bit of mad escalation. So we've got a challenge with a couple of trades. Uh, we'll work through that. So this is the finished product. And uh, we had this animated, but I can't get that to work here. Uh, in this case, though, this is how the river is normally formed and running. But the area generally uh, is, is enclosed by those sea camp piles that you saw earlier, allows the water to rise up uh, just clear below the bridges and uh, keep flowing. And then also go straight south through that wetland that you see at the, at the lower left. So it's a lot of volume to deal with. Uh, this is a lovely image of the typical things that we found down there. So you'd have bushes, the odd tree. The trees were really interesting because they were full of oil too. The, the roots suck everything up. Um, it was just kind of a wasteland. There were some industrial uses, some film use, everything kind of temporary, nothing large. Uh, then we got to digging. Uh, we, we've gone through and excavated 1.4 million cubic meters of soil. Our goal was to reuse a night, or rather 80% of that soil. Uh, we've been doing soil cleaning on site. Uh, we tried different technologies, uh, one by, by cooking the hydrocarbons out. Uh, that was marginally effective. We find that, that there's uh, solutions that work on very specific problems, others that don't in a general manner. Uh, so through bioremediation uh, and using biopiles and microbes, we've been able to deal with the bulk of the soil. So about 30% we had to dispose of, which is uh, more than we planned for. But we got it done. When we're done, of course, we have nice rivers, nice naturalized uh, growth. So we'll get into a little more detail of that. But again, when we look at this compared to this, we're, we're moving along. The project itself is made up of 23 elements and we've managed the project in those 23 elements and we track costs and design uh, tied back to those 23 elements. This way we can keep line of sight uh, to those components of work. So I have a director that looks after each of the major uh, components of work, earthworks, parks, bridges, structures, and roads and municipal services. So we can break things down into components 
and we're constantly managing money and adjusting scope as we go through to maximize uh, contingency and realign things and adjust things as we can as we proceed. It's a good way to get things done. You need a strong PMO behind that uh, to make sure your reporting is clean. And keep in mind, we have three levels of government to re report to, and we're the most audited organization and project in the country. Finished product. So in the end, we create an island, effectively an island of the south as well, uh, for, for development. There's some debate relative to what the density should be in these areas. Uh, the original concept plan was fairly low. Uh, we're thinking that it should be increased quite a bit. And uh, then look to see what can be done uh, to the south and to the east uh, and to the north uh, to increase densities and take advantage of the area. Uh, while we work with the governments to see what we can do to address transit. Again, uh, we've got East Harbor just up to the northeast, uh, and the transit then ultimately would loop back up to the East Harbor uh, subway and rail sites. So this is the river on completion after the trees get a chance to grow. Uh, to put this in a context, you can't just go out and buy uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of trees and millions of plants. So these have all been acquired. We have farms growing this material. And then we bring it onto site as the site gets ready for planting. That's been ongoing for a while. So I'm going to show you some images of that before I'm done. So I'm going to run through some construction prog progress issues. Uh, did I get ahead of myself again? No, oh, there we go. I'm sorry. I just want to make sure I got this right. There's a slight difference between my deck here and what's on the screen. Uh, this is uh, this was a video clip that we were going to run. Again, there's some technical challenges with that, so I'm going to skip over that. But you can see the videos online. We post them more or less every quarter, uh, showing progress with uh, drone flights around the site. So this is uh, ongoing work, and it's fairly recent. In the background, you can see the new Cherry Street uh, South Bridge. So the challenge here is interesting compared to Windsor. Um, they get to build a bridge and we get to build a river uh, under the bridge and then put the bridges over the river. Uh, they're shorter, but you know, it, it, it is complicated. Um, so with that, we also put in pedestrian bridges so you can access wetland areas. You can access um, different aspects of the river. There'll be paths, uh, different uh, levels of park finish, playground areas and the like uh, across the site. There's 80 some odd acres of parks plus the river valley, uh, then about 90 acres of development land on the, uh, on the uh, uh, new island. Uh, but again, you're freeing up about 800 acres, give or take. Uh, some of that will be parkland or remains parkland and marinas and the like, uh, but there's a large, large volume of land that becomes freed up for uh, housing in particular. Uh, again, elements being put in place. This is looking to the uh, uh, west. You can see downtown in the background and you get an idea of the views that you'll have from this area. They really are unique. If you go along the waterfront currently, you look out towards Toronto Island. Uh, from the Portlands, you see the islands, you see the city, you see the lake. Uh, and the farther vertical you go, the more that you see. Uh, so we're into planting now. In the background, you see an old fire hall. That was in the middle of Commissioner's uh, Road that runs east-west through the site. We lifted it, moved it to the south, placed it in the park. That'll become offices and washrooms on the site. Uh, but uh, again, you'll see uh, images uh, through this where the planting is taking place. So we're well along in terms of forming up the river. This is the river structure. So on the edge, you can see these secant piles. This is earlier on. Uh, and we work up to those, then we bury those structures. It was interesting in the springtime when we ran tours because it looked like lovely graded hills. All the structures, the flood protection landforms, uh, the environmental barriers that are underneath the river, there's layers and layers of structure to prevent oil from coming back up from the ground from underneath the river. Uh, so we got to protect that so we don't have the rainbow harbor. Right? So all this has to be put in place, maintained through construction, and be able to withstand these forces in time. So... You know, we're starting to shape up with the finishes and you're seeing here, uh, we're, we're putting planting in place. Uh, the tree stumps in the, in the uh, back of the or center of the picture uh, are fish habitat. 
Uh, we've got to tie those back into the structure. We have to find ways to source that type of product to get it into place. Uh, those are tied back into the ground so they don't get washed away. The stone in the front allows pedestrians to sort of get down closer to the water. There's other areas where we've provided water access as well. This is placement of the same. In the background, you can see the Hearn generating plant. Uh, the river itself, uh, the extension is about uh, just over a kilometer. Uh, what we don't talk about is the other half kilometer that's in the uh, current uh, river mouth. Uh, so we're naturalizing on the north side there. And then we're going north of Lakeshore Road, uh, past the East Harbor site up to Eastern Avenue, adding another three quarters. So this is over two, two and a half kilometers in total. So everything is now in lifts as we're finishing. Uh, the river will be open in 2024. Uh, the uh, planting is being put in place through this year next, and the parks will ultimately be finished by the end of 2024. The river will be open in June of 2024. Uh, this is the first bridge open, it's Cherry Street South. Underneath that bridge and to the one side, we have the uh, West Plug. So that area, we're just getting ready now to start uh, the opening for next year. Uh, so we're rushing with planting. We're finishing off what we can for this year. We start in the spring. We pull the plug uh, through the summer of next year, allow the water to come back in, get the plant stabilized, and then 2024, pull the uh, North Plug. This has been pretty popular already. A lot of people are enjoying it. Uh, we have not built the north part of Cherry Street, uh, the new Cherry Street alignment uh, beyond commissioners. So that'll be a next piece to open, which goes up to Lakeshore and creates a new intersection in that area. Again, wherever you look, the city's in the background in a big way. Uh, I talked about the areas uh, in the, um, Polson Slip, where the river mouth is. So to the north, there was a hard dock wall. We've removed that dock wall. You can see remnants of it in the background horizontally. And we've created a canoe cove, we're calling it. Uh, so in that area, you can go down, put your kayak in the water, put your canoe in the water, get near the water. I do warn you, though, that water uh, is still coming from the Humber River. So in a major storm event, there are combined sewer outlets up the river. So until they're gone, um, be careful. <laughs> That's another image. Cement plant in the background. Uh, these cement plants will never, ever move. That's what they'll tell you all the time as they have around the world up until the price is right and then they move. Um, so we'll see what that when that happens. But the land values, uh, you can imagine this area have, have uh, gone up exponentially. I'd say the land values were in the $4 million range prior to flood protection and approaching 50 million per acre near the river upon completion. Uh, we also uh, pulled down part of the gardener. So as part of the project, we had to uh, extend the bridges at Lakeshore by a couple of bays to create that extra flow. Um, so to do that, we had to work underneath the existing gardener ramps. Unfortunately, the gardener, as we all know, is a little bit shaky and it sits on piles made of something. Um, <laughs> They're either timber or steel or something. Uh, but what we didn't want to do is start drilling into that something and kill people. So we talked to the city. Uh, it was going to be a two-stage program to build those bridges. Uh, we finishing a piece, then the city coming back years later and finishing the rest. Instead, we were doing it in one shot. So we pulled down the gardener over five weeks, five weekends. So effectively 10 days um, and cleaned it up and then got on with our work, allowing the full bridge construction to take place. So that's happening. Uh, here we can see more planting, lovely stuff. We found as we did excavation, some odd plants coming out of the excavations. Uh, so we pulled them up. What the hell are these things? Uh, sent them off to a lab. Turns out there were seeds that were buried over a hundred years ago. Uh, so we farmed them, we figured out what they were and we're uh, replanting original species that were in the marsh and putting them back in place. Uh, so the planting goes on. Uh, we did specific testing. By the way, the bridges are three different colors given the scale of the site. It's about 250 acres. Uh, so we have the red bridges, the yellow bridges, uh, and orange bridge. So from an or orientation standpoint, uh, you can find people pretty quickly. And that, sorry, there it was. That brings us to the end of my rapid show. And I'd like to say questions, but we're out of time. All right. <laughs> I will be outside. <laughs>